Okay, thank you very much for your patience. Uh, this is a rather new experience for me being on stage. Uh, I, use, I am way more used to these lecture arenas where as a teacher you are generally being looked down upon. So, good experience for me. Um, first, I wish to introduce uh, the fellow authors who are sadly not here. Um, Johan Jöring is the principal designer of the e-tutoring system that we got our data from. Um, Ad Filders is um, in the algorithmic data analysis group and I am currently at the University of Amsterdam uh, where I do intelligent autonomous systems. Um, well, uh, when I was doing this research I was being a teacher in vocational education, higher education, uh, while doing my master thesis which is what this paper is about. This has a very positive effect, it is that there is a 130-page uh, document which contains a lot more information than the four-page <laughs> paper. Um, so what I will talk to you about is uh, first I'm going to show you the system, um, then what kind of model we used, uh, how we applied our model to the data we got from the tutoring system which is called ideas, um, and then some discussion about what is what are the good and the bad side of our model. So, first the demo. And, uh, it's getting rather big. Uh, it's a logic tutor. Um, um, you all speak logic, so to say? <laughs> My wife says I don't. Uh, <laughs> Yes, well, I, I guess many of us men recognize that. <laughs> um, but uh, could any of you just help me out here? What should I do here? If I want to uh, simplify this formula and I want to write it into conjunctive normal form. Uh, no, this is all right. I mean, the, the exercise is, uh, is quite visible. Anybody? Yes. Okay, you could do that. Um, however, I also got, uh, I'm, I, for the sake of time, I'm just going to do the quicker solution. Uh, <laughs> uh, I've got a false here, and false and Q is what? It's false. So I can just remove this part and say, I'm going to submit this, and I'm getting into trouble because the feedback area is on the left. Um, but um, if you would have looked at it you on the feedback area, it would have said, hey, well done, you've applied a rule correctly. So now what we can do, we can uh, continue with this, that false or something else is something else. And then what we have is not not Q, which is Q. And then we're done. Um, so this is the logic tutor that we have been working with and what comes out of that is a lot of data tracking which steps students take and uh, whether they did it correctly or not. I uh, just need to get back to the slideshow. There we go. Uh, so what does it do? Well it provides feedback depending on what the student does. Which rule does he try to apply and uh, if it is applied, um, did he apply it correctly? If not, do we know which kind of mistake he made? Um, the system, I don't know if you saw the, bottoms, uh, the buttons at the bottom, uh, which said, you can uh, ask for a hint. What should I do here? I can present a st uh, step that can be executed by the system. Um, if the student just totally says, uh, I give up, I can have the system complete the exercise for him. Um, I can take a step back and at the end I can say, hey, I think I'm done. Am I done? And the system says, yes, that's good, or no, you're not quite done yet. Good. Um, so how does the system do this? Um, there are these logic rules that are behind the system, which say, um, if I have a certain formula, which is the left-hand side of the equation, I can rewrite it to what is on the right. Like we have, uh, we have seen some of these, we got uh, P and false, which is false. 
and we had p or false, which is p, and somewhere there is not not, uh, which you can just remove. So these are the type of rules we are working with. And these are also the components that we want the students to learn. These rules are exactly what the students should learn in our system. Um, another thing that is um, rather novel about this system, but not my research, but previous research, is that this system combines these rules in strategies according to, um, well, these combinators. Um, I don't know if any of you is familiar with functional programming. I'm seeing very blank faces. Uh, <laughs> but there are just uh, some things, uh, some ways you can uh, combine different things. The um, less than uh, star greater than means uh, I do the left hand side first and then the other side. So you see, at the first, uh, the first thing I might do is to apply constant rules, then uh, definitions. What were those? Just one back. I see here the definitions, implications, elimination, and equivalence elimination. Then what I can do is uh, remove my negations. Uh, and uh, in the end, I can distribute uh, and over or. Um, why is this one last? Because he proposed it just yet. It's because it, uh, if you do it too early, then it might introduce a uh, way longer formula than you would get otherwise. Um, then we made one slight adaption to this. Uh, this okay, whenever if somewhere in the system we see a tautology or a contradiction, we apply that <laughs> uh, because it will give me some nice constants which I then can constants which I then can uh, use and then continue with the rest of the strategy. So this is the strategy the system wants to teach to the students. So um, what? ideas, as you just saw, does not do yet, is to provide more information for the teachers, and that is what we are for in a learning analytics conference. And we would like to have information about well, the competence of the students working on the system, how well they are learning, uh, but also about the rules themselves. What is the perceived difficulty of the different rules, and how well and how do these rules discriminate between students of different competence? Um, and we would like that to give as feedback to both teachers and to students, saying, you are doing this well. And uh, for teachers, it might be very important to say, this rule is being perceived as very difficult, so you might want to pay a bit more attention to that in the next class. OK. Another thing that is possible with this kind of information is to select exercise with, exercises with. Um, and the teacher has to decide uh, what, in what way the information can be used to select the exercise with. But if you get that information, you can implement a teaching strategy in the editoring system. So um, the model we wanted to create will include the following things. We want to provide the information about difficulty and discriminativity and uh, competence and learning. And we also want it to be a, a predictive model, which is mainly important for the teaching strategy. It's like how well, uh, what is the chance that an exercise will be done correctly by a student? Uh, why? Well, usually because you don't want to frustrate them by giving only exercises that are way too difficult. And you don't want to bore them either by giving exercises that are too easy. So there needs to be a balance between that. Um, so we want a model that is both descriptive and predictive. And that is the basis we started from. OK, so um, this is my introduction. I'll uh, now continue till the models we considered. Um, and just to remind you. Uh, <laughs> We want to operationalize this concept and predict outcomes. Um, we also, in, in this uh, process, involved teachers, students, and uh, domain experts who know a lot about the logic domain. Um, so we needed our model to be easily interpretable and informative. Good. Um, so there are different models. And actually, um, the top paper. Um, 
is contained uh, by, uh, I don't know how you pronounce it, Demare. Uh, from 2011 contains uh, Bayesian models without latent skills. So without saying, okay, this is difficulty and this is competence, but it just tries to predict the uh, outcomes as well as possible. And it makes it a very good model for prediction. Um, but it does not operationalize the concepts we just mentioned. Um, on the other hand, there is uh, item response theory, which has a good, um, which is a well-known uh, theory from the field of psychology, um, which is reasonably well at prediction, not as good as uh, Demare's work, um, but it does include three out of the four concepts we want. Um, and so we went for item response theory as a starting point. Um, so, um, John mentioned that uh, he was not seeing any formulas on the screen, uh, so uh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, what you see here is uh, the formula, it's a probability that a student will answer a certain rule, which is an item in our case, uh, correctly, will apply a rule correctly, given the competence of the student, the difficulty of the exercise, and the discriminativity of the item. Um, and that has a relation uh, which has a very, um, which is uh, sigma shaped. So it has this nice uh, curve. Um, and one of the nice properties of this, uh, which you should realize if you use this kind of model, that if the student uh, competence and the difficulty are on the same scale, so, and if the student competence equals the difficulty of the item, the probability of success is one half. So that's something that many people who first see the formula didn't, do not quite expect, but it's important. Okay, um, well as you saw, this model does not include learning yet, so we needed to extend this model. And we had several, several options for doing so. Uh, which is um, we can introduce a start competence and a learning rate and we can say, you know what, we can let these, uh, these two parameters vary uh, with um, every rule for every student. Um, and all the other options is basically we can make the student competence, the start competence uh, different for every rule. However, the learning rate is the same for a student overall the rules, um, etc. cetera. Uh, now one of these options was uh, eliminated by our domain expert, um, which is the following, um, which disappeared. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, namely that the uh, learning speed might be different for every rule, but the start competence would be the same, which sounded very illogical to our teaching domain experts. So we decided to not consider that model. Um, the other models that we have to consider is uh, sort of viewed by these uh, subscripts we have here. We say, okay, we have a starting competence which can depend on the rule in the student uh, and a learning rate which can depend on the rule or the student or it can depend just on the student. Uh, so what we did to select the model we would like is by doing simulation. Uh, we basically assumed the model which we uh, uh, provide for in the last slide with the formula. We generated data by it and we then try to recover the parameters that we wanted. And we see whether I, we could at least get, if the model is true, can we get the parameters back? Um, this appeared to be a very strong problem for option one, which is um, that all parameters can depend uh, that this on both the student and the rule. Uh, and basically, the parameters were completely beyond recovery when we did that. Um, so that's too bad. Um, then we had option two and three. Uh, and option two was that we can let the start competence vary per rule, um, uh, which is the gray points in the back. And you see that um, on the x-axis, we put the original parameter. On the y-axis, we put the recovered parameter. 
and you see there's a very large variance across the sort of one-on-one uh, -on -one line. Uh, so just out of practical uh, considerations, we took the model which says, okay, we have the starting competence and the learning rate depend on the student only. Uh, so the starting competence is the same for the entire domain. Um, and, um, and that recovered pretty well. You see it's uh, pretty much on the line. So we have uh, theta zero, which is the starting competence, and we have uh, eta, which is the learning rate. So we now have a model that at least uh, works in simulations, which is nice with these parameters. Um, but now, of course, we had one other problem, which is um, we could recover the parameters very well for pretty large data sets, which it's not illogical if you create it, if you have a lot of data, then uh, you can estimate more parameters. Uh, but the real life data we had uh, contained uh, 23 rules and 15 students, of which we could use only 14 because one of the students um, misunderstood the, the purpose and he couldn't figure it out. And then he started to answer rather random things. <laughs> Um, so one student wasn't, uh, we couldn't use. Um, and on average we had about uh, eight instances of a rule per uh, student over all the exercises. Um, so if we throw that into the simulation, we get a di bit different picture, um, which is we have our discriminativity, which is all around the place. Uh, the difficulty and the starting competence are being recovered rather well, but also the learning rate is, uh, well, has a much higher variance than we would like. Um, so if we increase the number of instances per rule, which sadly we didn't have, we see that at least the learning rate gets way more close to the one-on-one uh, -on -one line in recovery experiments. Uh, you see there the lightest points are eight instances per rule, um, then 12, and as it gets black, you get 16 instances per rule. And once we get to 16, you see that all the points are nicely aligned again. So that is um, what we got from our um, sort of lab tests. And now we wanted to apply it to the real data we get from the e-tutoring system. How did we do that? Um, Utrecht University of Applied Sciences is the school where I was teaching, so I could get a lot of, oh, that's quick. <laughs> I'll try to move quickly. Um, and we got three different groups of which we expected the latter to be the most competent at the beginning of the experiment. Furthermore, we had 23 rules. Um, which were ranked by three different domain experts and they just put them into order. Just no numbers or anything, just order. Uh, and we know from our, uh, from our simulations that our data size is that small that we have too high an uncertainty for discriminativity and learning speed, so we cannot draw conclusions on that, which is one of the main reasons why this work is still preliminary and why it's a short paper and not a full one. All right. Um, I'll just skip this. Um, what we got back from our model is indeed what we expected. We get the students which we expected to have the highest competence, starting competence, also get the highest score on, uh, from our model. So that's good to know. And these are our expert rankings, the diff one, two, and three, and the ranking we would get back from our model, uh, ML students for machine learning here. Um, and as you can see by the numbers, they're pretty well aligned. There are some surprises here as well. Um, one particular surprise I want to point at is rule number 10. Um, something P or true is true, uh, but students found it a lot more difficult because they found it counterintuitive from native language, from just their native languages. So I said, if something, something or true, well, then we look at something. Um, 
which is not true in logic. Uh, so we got that back from interviewing the students afterwards. Okay. Um, now, sadly, I, uh, I ran out of time, so I don't have time to discuss this table. However, um, I just wanted to point that uh, to validate our model further, we got back what we expected from, uh, which looks very positive, but we really need more data in order to get a, a better, uh, better side whether the discriminativity and the learning rates are applying very well. Um, good. Uh, so this is some work for future, and I want to point to my thesis where, as I've said, there is a lot more information on the choices we made, uh, more explanation about the results and what they mean, uh, and also some more underlying theory and theoretical results. Um, also, there is uh, a call for transparency in data, and all the data that we gathered are on there as well. Okay, I wish to thank you for your attention, and uh, I'm wondering whether there are any questions. I probably have time for one quick question. Uh, if the other speakers would like to come up, we can set up during that time. All right. Rebecca, Mike, you're going to cover that one? Yep. Uh, one. Which one? Uh, that takes a lot ahead. Uh, one quick question. The um, use of hints in the system, how does that affect the difficulty estimation of the items? Uh, uh, well, if a student asked for a hint, we assumed that he just didn't know it, and we assumed the, uh, and so we said that the uh, that rule was actually applied incorrectly. Uh, that's how we judge that.